black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black, everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We are joined today by Professor Claudrina and Harold. She's a professor of African-American and African studies and history at the University of Virginia, where she's also chair of the Department of History. She's the author of The Rise and Fall of the Garvey Movement in the Urban South, 1918 to 1942, Routledge in 2013, New Negro Politics in the Jim Crow South, University of Georgia Press 2016. She has co-edited several volumes, including The Punitive Turn, New Approaches to Race and Incarceration, and also Charlottesville 2017, The Legacy of Race and Inequity, uh, both published by the University of Virginia Press. And her latest book, and the reason why we're so excited to talk to her today, When Sunday Comes, Gospel Music in the Soul and Hip Hop Errors, published by the University of Illinois Press in 2020. Uh, of her new book, Robert Maravich writes, When Sunday Comes is the book we've been waiting for, a thoughtful and thought-provoking analysis of the impact of contemporary singers, songwriters, and musicians have made and continue to make on gospel music. With this volume, Claudina Harrell makes a valid argument for scholars to look more closely at this important period in gospel music history. How are you doing today, <laughs> Professor Harold? I'm doing well. I can't complain. How are you? I'm great. And, and I should add that she's also written, produced, and co-directed uh, several shorts, film shorts with her colleague, Kevin Everson, um, including Black Bus Stop. So just sit back and watch the album get raw. Just sit back and watch Which I enjoyed as a member of Phi Beta Sigma. Uh, it was <laughs> nice to see <laughs> some, some blue fires in the mix. Um, and you can watch these films actually on the Criterion channel. Um, so again, welcome. I, I want to start by talking to you about, you know, a section that you write early in the book about your mother's listening practices, right? And, and this is something that Daphne Brooks also talks about in her book, Liner Notes, um, and, and how your mother, you know, didn't make a distinction between secular and sacred, right? It, it was all played the same way. Talk a little bit about what it was like listening, you know, to music in your home growing up, particularly gospel music. Yeah, so I lived in a home where all musicians were called by their first name. <laughs> but I also lived in a home <laughs> that when my mom said James, I didn't know if she was talking about James Brown or James Cleveland. <laughs> and um, she talked about them with the same kind of reverence and respect and they could do no wrong. Um, and so growing up in Jacksonville, Florida, I had to hear stories about her first time seeing James Brown uh, in Jacksonville at the Veterans Coliseum, the many times that she saw James Brown, the many iterations of James Brown. And I also heard her stories about seeing um, James Cleveland as a college student at Florida a &M University and the ways in which he put on a show that compared to the dynamic performances of The Temptations, which she saw in Gainesville. And so I grew up in a household where music was always playing. There was no division between the sacred and the secular. Get up, get on up, stay on the scene. Get on up, I like a sex machine. Wait a minute. You may hear Bobby Blue Band one moment and then the next moment you're listening to Gladys Knight and then the next moment you're listening to um, Shirley Caesar and the caravans. And so uh, that really shaped my initial approach to gospel music as something that was spiritually and intellectually rich, but something that was deeply connected to African-American culture. And I should note that I grew up in a household where people purchased records. Yeah. And so my entry into the world of gospel music was through the record, even though we attended church, but it was very much through the record and listening to the music, but also reading the liner notes. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I'm listening to gospel music, sort of, I guess you could say intellectually, um, in the 1990s and the early 2000s, you know, you have what I call those filling, 
I call them Philistation um, CDs, where you open it up and there's no liner notes at all. (laughs) And so the record becomes extremely important because that's where you heard stories about James Cleveland, about Shirley Caesar. And um, so it was really my mother that nurtured me and also my, my aunt and uncle who for some odd reason, didn't get cable until like the 2000s. <laughs> so when I when I would go to their house in the 1980s and I played basketball and, and it was frustrating to me that they didn't have cable and they didn't have basketball hoop nearby. So I would just go into the basement and I would just listen to their records and I would just read really out of sheer boredom. Um, but that was my entry into the world of um, African-American popular music and the Black sacred tradition. And so it was very much a kind of reading culture and a listening culture. The the book is titled After a Tri-City Singers Recording. Uh, What was so significant about When the Sunday Comes, When Sunday Comes for you? First of all, it's just Sheer Genius by Daryl Coley. When Sunday Comes My trouble gone. The vocal mastery, uh, his ability to fuse jazz and gospel, but it's also the audience and their anticipation for that moment when Daryl Coley hits that note and makes those runs. And for me, when Sunday comes is sort of a spiritual metaphor of the relationship between the gospel musician and the audience and that climatic moment when we know that ecstasy has been achieved, um, artistic uh, mastery has been achieved. That is when Sunday comes. And that's the beauty about gospel music is that it's not just about the um, sonic perfection or the mastery of form, but it's also about when the audience recognizes that. And that's when Sunday comes. That's when new possibilities are created. You opened the book talking about Reverend James Cleveland. And I'm still chuckling at the idea that when your mother talked about James, you didn't know which James she was referring to. Um, and, and And, you know, and that's such a useful framing, I think, of James Cleveland. You know, when you consider that he passed away at age 59, it, it feels as though he was gospel music forever. And, and we're only really talking about a 30 year period, you know, in which his imprint is there. But it was so profound that in many ways you can't think of gospel music in that period of time without first uttering his name. Um, talk a little bit about why James Cleveland is so important. Uh, and, and I'm thankful for you, particularly this chapter, because there really isn't a whole lot of critical work on James Cleveland. Um, He is someone, I think, who's been understudied um, in terms of his impact, not just on gospel music, um, but Black music. And and as you argue, you know, you know, with the idea of the university, of the college, um, a broader view of what Black possibilities are. Somebody's knocking. Without James Cleveland, we're not having this conversation. Uh, His artistic contributions are so many, so many artistic contributions. The songs that have shaped uh, Black life, Sunday morning, peace be still, um, Lord help me to hold out, God is, you know. I have some Kanye fans in my music class and I played them the James Cleveland version of God is. And they were like, oh, Um, but James Cleveland as an institution builder, you know, in 1968, when he creates the Gospel Music Workshop of America, which is still going strong. And he provides an institutional space for gospel artists to develop their talent, to gain control over their artistry and their art, to understand the economics of the business. Um, It is one of a kind. There's nothing like the Gospel Music Workshop of America. And 
from 1967 until his death in 1991, he controlled that institution. And that institution played a critical role in the success of John P. Key uh, and Kurt Franklin. Um, so when I think about James Cleveland in terms of his artistry, but also his institution building, um, there's no parallel. There are young folk that have talent, but nowhere to get instruction as to how to put that talent to work. And so I thought, how could we help upgrade the music in the church and bring some type of education to the youth? To find really, I think, a parallel to James Cleveland, you have to extend beyond the world of gospel. Um, he is that, that important, but he is also the quintessential in terms of his artistry. Uh, the blues man. Marvin Winans talked about uh, hearing James Cleveland for the first time and how James Cleveland could just say, shh, shh. <laughs> and the audience would just go crazy. I mean, they would just go crazy. Can I get a witness here tonight? When Aretha Franklin says, sing James, you know, she captures the feeling of millions of millions of, 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 of black people. He is, he is the paradigm um, for so many, for so many people. And um, it just, there's, there's no one like him in terms of longevity. You can look at Billboard magazine, for example, in the 19. After really Peace Be Still, and I think Peace Be Still, which comes out in 1963, stays on like the top of the charts for like five years. Um, but there are moments in the 1970s in Billboard's, you know, top 10 gospel albums. It, it's like eight James Cleveland albums in the top 10. Um, <laughs> that's the kind of dominance that he had. And to have that kind of success where you're selling records. I mean, he was selling records, too. Um, in an art form where sometimes people listen on the radio, but they don't buy. You have to buy James Cleveland. You know, so James Cleveland's albums, Peace Be Still, I Stood on the Banks, um, the Greatest Hits album. Um, that was a central, that had a central place in my home. And as, as much of a central place as, you know, the OJ's Backstabbers and Teddy Pendergrass, all of that was there. But yeah, James Cleveland is just, is just huge. And when people wanted that gospel sound, you know, when Quincy Jones is putting roots together, you know, and you think about, okay, how am I going to get that? Who are you going to call James Cleveland? I think even when we think about Amazing Grace, and sometimes I forget this, but if you look at the cover of Amazing Grace, it's Aretha Franklin with James Cleveland. Yeah. So it was, it, was, it was understood that he not only was going to bring something in terms of his artistry, in terms of his piano playing, which is so distinctive, but he was also going to bring something in terms of sales. So he's on Savoy, she's on Atlantic. And to think about that happening in 72, like that, where it's with James Cleveland, um, it is a... It is a testament to his, his singularity. And um, the fact that there is no biography on him says a lot. Yeah. It, it's funny you, when you first mentioned, you know, Aretha telling James, James this thing. And, and I just, I, I got chills remembering that moment in Precious Memories, like where she's like, you ought to sing that one more more time <laughs> right? it, it, it's 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 magic and and you know you talk about his work ethic um and thinking outside of gospel right when you think about the number of albums that he's producing in the 1960s i mean i mean he's functioning in a, a in a mixtape culture before we even know there's a, a mixtape culture i mean the productivity and the quality of the productivity is just absolutely astounding in that period of time yeah yeah i mean he's like his own Motown. And then when you think about the unique contract that he has with Savoy, in order to get on with Savoy, you know, you, you kind of have to know James Cleveland. So there's an entire series of records called um, James Cleveland Presents, you know, James Cleveland Presents This Quartet, This Choir. 
Um, and so once again, his impact on the industry and that spirit of collectivism that says, you know, I'm big, I'm making a lot of money, but in order to advance the art form, I got to help someone else. And I got to help someone just like that Black sacred tradition in Chicago or that Black sacred order that Wallace Best talks about, that helped him. So without a Mahalia Jackson, I mean, he's Mahalia Jackson's paper boy. <laughs> he sings and he's at Pilgrim Baptist, you know, the <laughs> choir directed by Thomas Dorsey, you know, is being trained under Roberta Martin. So it's also like, you know, it's kind of like Michael Jackson going to, you know, elementary school at Motown, you know, high school at Philadelphia International, you know, then college with Quincy Jones. It's like kind of, okay, you got to be good too. Like, so this training that he has from the best of the best. You know, he talked about being a young boy and just stopping at, you know, at Mahalia Jackson's uh, beauty shop and just listening to her hum. You know, that kind of training that you get from also being in a Black community and a Black institution. So when I was writing this book and I visited Chicago, I mean, I had to go to the archives, but I had to go to Pilgrim and I had to just try to trace him and trace his life and trace the institutions that shaped him because um, he's the paradigm for, for gospel, but I think he's the paradigm. He's the paradigm for us. He's the paradigm for us Black scholars and Black studies. Like he provides a paradigm, problems and all, with what it means to institution build, what it means to, to, to build something. And um, you know, hugely, hugely, hugely important. Um, and I'm, I'm so, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that people read this book and, and, and study more about him. And I mean, and even the gospel college, I mean, you know, to create a, this idea that I'm going to create a college so that we can also perpetuate and, and advance the art form. It's just, um, he's singular. And, and that's one part of the story that, that I did not know a whole lot about. And, and, you know, because there's a, a book out now, there's a new attention towards what Floyd McKissick Sr. was trying to do with Soul City. Um, and, and for Cleveland and his folks to understand the value of bringing the Gospel Workshop of America to that place, um, you know, it speaks to an underlying Black nationalist politics that's, that's part of James Cleveland's, you know, vision that we don't talk a great deal about. Um, but talk a little bit about what he's imagining for this gospel college. Yeah, so in 1968, he creates the Gospel Music Workshop of America. I should note that there's some debate within the organization. Some people say 1967. Um, some of the founders say, no, that did not happen in 1967. But let's just say 1967, 1968, he creates the Gospel Music Workshop of America. It has a series of conventions, their annual conventions. But by 1974, 1975, James Cleveland and his really right-hand man, Edward Smith, begin to talk about the importance of having a college where they can train um, Black, Black students, people who are interested in music, people who are interested in theology, people who are interested in the business of the church. They want to create a college where all of those things can happen, and they need space, they need land. And around the same time, we know that Soul City is happening in North Carolina. And so James Cleveland and his associates begin to have conversations with Floyd McKissick about the formation of uh, a, a Black gospel college that will be modeled along the lines of a Berkeley. And so basically from 1975, 1974 to 1976, they're working hard to make um, this Black gospel college a reality. At the same time, Soul City is developing. They want cultural programs. And so there's this, there's this link, you know, James Cleveland is sort of saying to Floyd McKenzie, you have the political strength. You also have land. I also have a name. And right. um, they work very hard on this. I mean, they're, they're, they're having conversations. They're talking in Detroit. They're talking in North Carolina. And then comes, you know, Jesse Helms <laughs> and North Carolina conservatives who um, attempt to defeat Soul City at every turn. And we know the um, 
it doesn't come to fruition. But I think this is an extremely important moment because it demonstrates or illustrates that kind of Black nationalism that's also operating in gospel music, but not a Jesus is Black kind of Black nationalism. Um, it is, a, I think, a sacred sort of variant of Black liberation theology, but it is that, that kind of Black nationalism that you see in, in gospel music. And he picks up on this again in the 1980s, even after the sort of quote collapse of Soul City, and I don't like to use that term, but he's still thinking about this in the 1980s because it's always for James Cleveland about how do we create some space for Black people to sort of to, to maximize their their potential as artists um, and as human beings. You know, it's interesting, and I'm sure Jesse Helms didn't necessarily think about the gospel component in in this way. But there's a way in which institutionalizing the teaching of gospel, right, particularly in its relationship to the Black freedom struggle, I, I could imagine some conservatives saw that as dangerous as the Black Panthers breakfast program, right? The, mm -hmm. the idea of socializing young Black folks around the music, right, to, to be engaged politically. Um, you also mentioned in this moment in the mid 19th 70s, which which feels like a heyday, you know, of of Cleveland's career. But this debate that he gets in with the mighty clouds of joy. The mighty clouds of joy. Take a load off your high. Ride the mighty glory. Listen to my story. Ride the mighty high. Take the load off your mind. Ride the mighty glory. Listen to my story. Ride the mighty high. Truth be told, I, I grew up in a mighty clouds of joy and Shirley Caesar household. And we'll, and we'll talk about, you know, Miss Caesar in a second. Um, and, and I can remember when, you know, before Mighty High, the Mighty Clouds of Joy had hit with a song called Time. All these things take time. And I, and I just remember it playing in the house over and over again. Then Mighty High hit, and it was like, it was something that was really, really brand new, right? Coming after the Hummingbirds, you know, cover Paul Simon and win a Grammy and this whole deal. Um, and you capture this moment where James Cleveland and, and the Mighty Clouds are debating about the commercialism of gospel music, right? And, and, and of course, you have a family connection, right? Because this is music that's, you know, being produced by Dave Crawford, who's an uncle, um, talk a little bit about the substance of this debate. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting debate. So in 1974, I think, and it may be 1973, but I think 1974, ABC purchases Peacock Records and the Mighty Clouds of Joy on Peacock. And um, ABC has a lot of faith in the Mighty Clouds of Joy's crossover appeal. The staple singer success, as well as Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace, had really opened up um, these major companies to the possibility of, of crossover success. And so they pair um, the Mighty Clouds of Joy with a, a, um, <laughs> a young producer out of Jacksonville, Florida, who's also my mother's brother. I mean, my mother's brother, Dave Crawford. And uh, he does Time and he then later does the Mighty Clouds of Joy's Mighty High. Um, and I would suggest anyone and everyone to look at their performance on Soul Train because they look so <laughs> awkward. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> and from what I understand, my uncle felt that awkwardness when he was producing them. I think he was very nervous about that. A man You know, they come out with Mighty High and it's a smash hit. You know, it's a smash on the dance charts and on the disco charts. Um, I think it climbs as high as number one. And for those of you who may be more 1980s folks, you know, thank the Clark sisters. You brought the sunshine. But I think think a little bigger. Um, so Mighty High was just huge and it was called um, Gospel Rock. Um, I don't know why it was called <laughs> Gospel Rock. It doesn't sound like rock to me, but it was rocking, I guess. I don't know. It was played in the discos that, of course, you know, they're, they're straight folks, gay folks. Um, 
secular folks and sacred folks. Because from what I understand, James Cleveland also frequented the discos. But anyway, he <laughs> didn't think that gospel should be in that space. And um, I think some of it had to do with also a predominantly white space um, and gospel being played. And so there emerges this big debate of, you know, has gospel gone too far? And of course, those of us who love Ebony and Jet Magazine know that uh, Jet Magazine would do an issue, has gospel gone too far every three years? Um, (laughs) And so the first issue of gospel, has gospel gone too far, was in 1976. And it was over the mighty clouds of joys, uh, mighty high. James Cleveland made the argument that you didn't need a rock beat, a disco beat to sell the message. Um, He sort of made some kind of purist stand, which is interesting because he's not a purist. I mean, especially when you consider him remixing Gladys Knight's Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, And the Mighty Clouds of Joy say, look, we're a quartet. We're not a choir. We're not James Cleveland. We're not one person. We got to sell records. We got to sell records to stay on the contract. We got to sell records so that we can go and perform and tour and people want to hear what we have to say. And so there emerges in 76, this really um, tense um, and complex debate about the direction of gospel music and, and the mighty clouds of joy in that song and the place of that song, um, I think in the canon. Um, And I think, I think James Cleveland, who is who is very open in a lot of ways too, but I think when they're having that debate in 1976, I think there's just a lot of tensions about not just the mighty clouds of joy, but the sound of gospel is diversifying. You know, you got you got Andre Crouch and contemporary Christian music, and you know, <laughs> praise and worship, and then you have Rance Allen, who's just like funking everything up, you know, Um, and so gospel music is becoming more diversified, and I think they're just, you know, there's this intense, there's this debate that plays out, um, that plays out publicly, and it's interesting, that song is so interesting to me, because I must admit, um, my favorite song by the Mighty Clouds of Joy, um, which was oddly enough produced by James Cleveland. I've been in a, you know, I've been in a storm too long. That's probably my favorite. Um, I didn't grow up. Mighty High had a certain place in my family, in family lore, but I didn't grow up loving that song until August 21st, 2017. And I never forget, it was the first day of class after August 11th and August 12th. And, you know, you're trying to be tough, you know, you got to go in and and, and lecture and you don't want your students to notice that you're nervous, um, that you're insecure. The University of Virginia had not made any statement about where they were going to, where they stood in terms of the white supremacists who were threatening to come back. And I remember walking across the lawn and I always turned to music in those difficult times. And I pulled out my iPod and I played Mighty High, you know, and it's like, you got to ride the Mighty High. And it just hit in a certain way that it had never hit before. It just had never, it had never resonated like that. And I don't know if it was the song. I don't know if it was um, the words knowing that the words were from, were from my uncle, but it just connected in a, in a certain way. And I think as he was transitioning from Atlantic Records to, to, to um, ABC and you're going from work, working with Wilson Pickett to now you're in this, this new space, working with B.B. King and <laughs> the Mighty Clouds of Joy, he knew he had to write the Mighty High. And so it's, it's interesting to me how that song takes on this deep meaning and at the same time, my grand aunts were like, that ain't gospel. <laughs> so it wasn't just James Cleveland, let's be clear. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. You mentioned gospel in the club, and, and it reminded me of E. Patrick Johnson's work about uh, you know, listening to Hold My Mule um in black and queer clubs, you know, in the 90s, um, you know, which of course brings us to, to Shirley Caesar. I was in trouble. And, and you referenced early season in a couple of contexts. One, the importance of place and thinking about her work and who she was, right? She is a, you know, a dorm 
Durham native. Um, so, you know, clearly very special to this region. And, and I got to tell you, you know, I mentioned living in a mighty clouds of joy, which was my father's thing, and really the 60s mighty clouds. Um, and Shirley Caesar was my mom's thing, right? So, you know, my testimony, tear your kingdom down, Jordan River, stranger on the road, don't drive your mother away, no charge. I mean, that's that's just my my childhood, right? In, in a nutshell, um, talk a little bit about Shirley Caesar's longevity, right? I mean, because one of the ways that we get to Shirley Caesar, of course, is through the caravans. And James Cleveland, of course, played with them for a few years and wrote some songs to them. And the caravans are really the first super group that I, you know, I would say a super group, not even just in terms of gospel, but black music. You know, they're, they're Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers before Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. When you consider the people who come out of the caravans, what was so significant about Shirley Caesar? A genius. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the first lady of gospel music. Y'all better get ready. You better get ready. Are you ready? The great Shirley Caesar. A master of many forms. The Zora Neale Hurston of gospel music when it comes to storytelling. I like that. I like that. The James Brown of gospel music when it comes to dancing. <laughs> and the Stevie Wonder of gospel music when it comes to a collection of great albums that you can play from beginning to end. I hear the words of the song ringing in my spirit that says never. Let everybody say never. never. There is no one like her, and she mastered so many forms. She could do gospel, she could infuse country, soul, uh, rock. There was nothing that she couldn't do. I would make the argument she's the most, her genius is almost underrated. Yeah. Um, when you think about her longevity, uh, born in, in Dorm, North Carolina, once again, shaped by Black institutions in Dorm, the daughter of tobacco workers, the daughter of James Caesar, who was allegedly one of the greatest singers of that kind of quartet era. Mm. joins the caravans, which is like the Supremes of the Supremes, you know, just amazing. <laughs> uh, James Cleveland, Albertina Walker, you know, Cassetta George, Inez Andrews, joins the caravans and just integrates into that, into that space so easily and so young. Yeah. Um, I won't come back no coward soldier. And she takes the group really to another level. So my mother's first concerts were seeing Shirley Caesar in the caravans at Mount Eric Church in Jacksonville. And my mother, like so many of her peers, would tell stories of Shirley Caesar grabbing the mic and singing and shouting and running down the aisle and not missing a step and not missing a note. <laughs> 1966, I mean, then she goes solo and she releases I'll Go, which is just brilliant. And there's a song on that um, called Rapture and it is so soulful. Don't be afraid. Satan, I'm going to tear your kingdom down. She just is producing for HOB. She's producing hits after hits after hits. And it's like, okay, I got this gospel thing, you know. Um, I can be soulful. You know, I can be almost stats records by way of Calvary. <laughs> and then she does the country thing. So no charge. 
So right. first time I heard Ashley Melba Montgomery's version, I was like, what's doing this? What is lady singing Charlie Sheen's song? <laughs> what is this? Um, you know, and so just the mastery of form, the albums, you know, but also very much committed to her career and the progression of her career and really willing to make, um, to take chances. So she's a person that really demonstrates the limitations of the contemporary and the traditional category. Because we may put her in that traditional category, but if you listen to stuff that she produced, that she did with Rose Show, it's funky. And she doesn't lose a beat. And then she goes to Rose Show and she hooks up with Tony Brown, this major country producer. And she signs with Word Records, which is, you know, in that year, they signed two important Black people, Shirley Caesar and Al Green. And up until then, they really didn't sign African-Americans. Um, and on our first recording with Word, I mean, she covers Bob Dylan's You Gotta Serve Somebody. Yeah. Um, and she just, you know, and then in 1988, you know, she comes out with um, Live in Chicago, which is brilliant. And it has Hold My Mule, which um, not only demonstrates, I think, her mastery of form, but also her ability to talk about the class tensions within the African-American community, just her political vision. Now, mind you, a year before she recorded that, she had one seat on Durham City Council. I mean, just her, so her range. Um, there's no one like her. There's, had there's Paul, no one back like to her. school to get a degree from Shaw. I mean, it's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's no one. It's no one like her. And she is. Um, her, her, her politics, her artistry, um, her complex ideas about race, class and gender and how um, she forces you as a writer and a thinker to discard any theory that you may have and to just work with her and the text. Um, one of my favorite stories on Shirley Caesar is when she's talking about feminism and she said, you know, I don't embrace feminism and, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to do it this way and I don't have any label. And then in that classic kind of ebony magazine sort of way, they have a picture of her driving her big, the, the big, the, 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 the tour bus, you know, and so it's like always these, these, these narrative and these, these textual and these visual contradictions, but she is, um, She's the paradigm. And, 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 and fortunately, when you think about the sources, she's a person that um, she's also been in control of her story. So she's written an autobiography, but also we know there are people um, like Cheryl Giltz um, who've written amazing articles on Shirley Caesar. Um, and so she is just, um, she's one of a kind, her, her genius. And, and, I, and I will criticize myself and I will criticize um, the book in some ways, you know, I don't spend a lot of time with her um, sermonettes and her sermonettes um, by themselves. I mean, I know there are people, I think um, Eugene Brooksy Harrington at Fayetteville State University, um, who was at Ohio State in the 90s, he wrote a brilliant dissertation on sort of the literary qualities of Shirley Caesar. And I know I've always listened to Courtney Bryant talk about Shirley Caesar. And so I'm waiting for you know, her stuff. So there's just so many people doing some amazing, she gives us so much to work with. Um, so much. I, I want to shift gears a little bit because we're, we're in this interesting moment where these gospel icons are now being subject uh, to television. Um, so thinking about the, the Clark sisters television movie from last year, here, the recent Mahalia Jackson movie, um, uh, the, the six nights or eight nights of uh, genius Aretha, um, which actually spends, you know, a, a great deal of dealing with a kind of gospel world, black church world history. How do you feel about these treatments of these iconic figures? You know, I think it's great. I think it's great when more people can be introduced um, to the stories of these gospel artists and when gospel music is not told as a sort of precursor to something greater happening, yeah. but yeah. is the, the the central component, you know, that is not, you know, this is what someone learned in a church and then they made money. Um, so I think it's great that we get a sense of, um, with the Clark sisters, you get a sense of their artistry, you get a sense of the intense, intense training um, that they received. Um, 
And you also get a sense of the interiority of um, their lives. Um, there were, you know, there's, there's always going to be with films, aspects of films that you don't like. Um, at times I didn't like the portrayal of Twinkie, but that's a whole nother story. Um, I think, um, I think the story of Twinkie Clark and the story of Sound of Gospel Records, and if you know anything about the story of Westbound Records, um, <laughs> you know, that, that, whole, that whole rendering of kind of the finances is a much more complicated story uh, right. than was told in the film. But I think it's, um, you know, I, 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 think it's, I think it's great. And I'm also looking forward to people like, you know, Jatavia Gary and Colleen Smith, more independent Black um, women filmmakers who are incorporating gospel into their music and who are incorporating the story of gospel and I think are going to take it in some, some even better directions. And so it's, 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 it's really, it's, it's good to see and it's good to see um, for the joy that it provides the, gos the gospel consumer. Um, Mark, I don't think you understand how frustrated our lives can be sometimes, you know, we always are on the back burner so that, you know, to get a film about gospel music, you know, right, right, right. hopefully to get some gospel, you know, CDs reprinted with liner notes that, you know, would be nice, you know, so to, to see gospel treated seriously and with care is great. And, you know, and I, and I expect more of that when you think about people like Queen Latifah and Missy Elliott, who are getting into film and who also have been influenced by these folks, you know, um, Clark's sisters central to Missy Elliott's development and to her sound. And so, um, and, and, and Mary J. Blige. So I, you know, I think it's, I think it's a good thing and I hope it's also complemented or, or, or it, it comes with more, more scholarship um, and also more accessible scholarship on gospel. I mean, part of the challenge as you talk about is, is just even having access to some of the music, you know, it, it's criminal how little of the Savoy catalog, the gospel catalog is available, right? And we, we think of the streaming services now as like this corner Copia to find stuff and, and then you find real gaps, you know, and things like gospel music from the 50s and the 60s, um, you know, trying to find, um, you know, the copy of Time that I have I burned <laughs> from from vinyl 20 years ago. And, and that's the only reason why I have a, a digital copy of it. Um, but as you talk about these movies, and I don't know how much you had a chance to watch Genius Aretha, um, but Omar Dorsey's depiction of James Cleveland. Um, you know, it, it struck two things for me that it, it was such a dead on ca capturing a James Cleveland. And, and where's the James Cleveland movie? Right. That that's the other piece. Yeah. You know. Um, I hope it happens, you know, and I hope the James Cleveland movie happens and I hope the biography happens. But this is where I think we have to talk about the silencing of the archives. Right. And um, the ways in which, you know, questions surrounding James Cleveland's sexuality and his death um, has made it, um, and I think some people are dealing with this, but it has, it has made it difficult. I must say, I attended the Gospel Music Workshop of America, and I didn't have that angle with my book, but I attended the Gospel Music Workshop of America's um, 50th anniversary um, convention, and they have an academic portion that just focuses on the history of the organization. They have the largest traveling library. So they have like everything they've ever collected is in somebody's home for the entire year. And then they put it out during the convention. It, it's amazing. But when I attended and you know you announce and you ask about the history, and I never forget one member said, I don't know how he died and I didn't see any birth certificate. So before I could answer, or ask any question, that's what, you know, that 80 year old woman said, okay, this is gonna be the terms of our conversation. And that was fine. Um, but, it, it, you know, and so I think, um, first of all, I think you can just talk about the art and the artistry and all of those things. And, you know, there's there should be multiple James Cleveland biographies, but I think um, we have to deal with the fragility of the archive that you talked about in terms of burning a time album. I, you know, um, James Cleveland's Savoy collection, I think is just now on iTunes. I think that's happened within the past year. Um, and so then when you think about, you know, just the fragility of the archive, black gospel, 
uh, record stores um, are closing. They're not many. And when they close, like Reed's closed in, in the Bay Area um, a couple of years ago, when they closed, it's like so much history, even on the walls yeah. that we lose. And so, yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot now. Um, you have to introduce someone to the best of gospel music. And you got to pick five songs. What five songs are you picking? The best. <laughs> or your favorite. How about we just do your favorites? Um, okay. Because I think some of my favorites not going to make the cut. But I, let's, okay. <laughs> um, James Cleveland and Aretha Franklin's uh, Precious Memories. Yeah. So I can get two of my favorites out with one song. <laughs> Uh, Shirley Caesar, Don't Be Afraid. That was a tough one because I want to say, um, Satan, I'm going to tear your kingdom down. Um, Walter Hawkins and Tremaine Hawkins going up yonder. Yeah, yeah. Sam Cook, uh, Canaan. I can't do the fifth one. <laughs> this is t this is really this is really unfair. This is tough. Um, no, it's not my favorite, but I think to get a sense of the variety that I think um, will take us to Michael Jackson's funeral. I'm gonna do Andre Crouch soon and very soon. Okay. It, it's, it's funny when you just tilted your head, I just noticed that the Time album is sitting right there behind you. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, so much to talk about because we could have had another half hour conversation talking about Andre Crouch too. Um, yeah. We've been joined today by Professor Claudina Harold, um, who's professor of African American and African Studies and History at the University of Virginia, where she's also the chair of the Department of History. Uh, she's the author of several books: The Rise and Fall of the Garvey Movement in the Urban South, 1918 to 1942. That's Routledge, 2013, and also New Negro Politics in the Jim Crow South, University of Georgia Press, 2016. And we were honored to talk to her today about her latest book, When Sunday Comes, Gospel Music in the Soul and Hip Hop Errors, published by the University of Illinois Press. Thank you very much for joining us today, Professor Harold. Uh, thanks for having me. Black lights and burn 